Now I'd like to introduce you to today's featured speakers. They are, first, Robert Kosnitz, who's a professor at the University of Southern California, and Rebecca Perrin, who is assistant professor at Cal State University in San Marcos. First, on Rob, let me give you a little more detail. He's an academic innovator who has developed important methods and theories that are widely used around the world, including in 1995, he invented netnography. And since that time, he's taught digital research methods combined with marketing and branding theories to academics as well as companies such as Lowe's, Amex, Nissan, TD Bank, Campbell Soup, L'Oreal, Sony, Merck, and many others. His research pushed the boundaries open to more cultural methods of understanding brands and social media and has changed market research. He's a chaired professor at University of Southern California's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism and a professor in the Marshall School of Business. He's an author of several books. Uh, one is a volume uh, theory of theory about consumer tribes. And he's also starting his second term as associate editor of the Journal of Consumer Research and is an academic trustee of the Marketing Science Institute and co-chair of the upcoming Association for Consumer Research 2018 conference in Dallas. Let me tell you a little bit about Rebecca, and then we'll come back to, uh, to Rob to, to kick it off. Rebecca, uh, assistant professor of marketing at Cal State San Marcos. Her professional experiences are quite diverse, from marketing management for several firms in the skydiving industry to providing service and expert advice to financial advisors in the brokerage industry. She's earned her doctoral degree in marketing from the University of Central Florida, also has degrees from Stetson and University of South Florida. Her research focuses on tensions and synergies uh, with consumption at the intersection of social and market domains, particularly those facilitated by network technologies and social media. She's received many awards and fellowships as a student, and uh, she is founding co-chair of the PhD Project Committee for Hispanic Excellence. Uh, program in higher education. So with that, I will turn it over to Rob to begin the presentation. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Gordon, and thanks, Hannah, for, for uh, all the organizational work that you've put into it. So uh, you know, let, let's jump into it and talk about technologies and marketplaces, because um, that's what this topic is really all about. So powered by the growth of mobile communication technologies, the for-profit use of web platforms to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer exchanges already reaches about 72% of the American adult population, as you can see with this um, graph that we've pulled down from Pew Internet Research on the right-hand side of this slide. Uh, there are estimates that those kind of peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, companies that you'd be familiar with like Airbnb and Uber, are already a $10 billion or more market in the United States. Uh, and PricewaterhouseCoopers recently projected that it's going to become a $335 billion industry worldwide by 2025. But no matter how you define it, and we're going to be defining our terms in a moment, uh, this so-called sharing economy is here to stay, and it's rapidly expanding. But there are really um, two big problems I'm going to start with with the sharing economy. The first one is a terminology problem. So we know that words are important. Uh, the linguist Alfred Korzybski said that the map is not the territory. And by that, he meant that our perception of things, such as these kind of new marketplace phenomena, can't be separated out from the reality of what they are. So by calling them the sharing economy, we, we're focusing on certain aspects of these markets, but we think that you, we're blinding ourselves to certain other realities about those. And I'm going to get that, into that in a moment. The second one is that we have an, an understanding gap. Because these markets are so new, we really don't know very much about them. So let's, let's take a look at each of those problems in turn. And start, we'll start with the terminology one. So we know that these things are popular and growing, but what should we call it? Uh, you know, there's a real question about whether we should call this sharing. Uh, you know, sharing, sharing really means uh, using jointly. So sure, we use these things jointly. We use things like uh, seats in an Uber jointly. But a seat in a regular taxi uses the seat jointly as well. So does a seat on a bus or on an airplane or stay in a fancy hotel. So is it really fair to call booking a ride on Uber or, or in a hotel or an, in an Airbnb sharing? Or does that kind of nice word stop conveying meaning when it's stretched this far? Uh, you know, the reason I'm asking this is obviously that we looked at it and we thought that 
the term sharing is a bit too broad and, and, and too idealistic and really does not accurately describe some of the most important aspects of the phenomenon that we, that we were looking at. We looked at other related words too, such as collaborative consumption and access-based consumption. Uh, those terms are both about transactions and consumption in which there's no transfer of ownership. So ownership stays with the individual. But we felt that ownership was not really the big issue in these types of business arrangements, the more different kinds that we looked at. That really what was going on here was more interesting because it's about coordinating activities between a certain kind of market player, and that kind of market player really becomes uh, important. Belk defined the overarching phenomena as one that encompasses both for-profit and not-for-profit organizations based on people coordinating the acquisition and distribution of a resource for a fee or other compensation. And we thought that was definitely getting closer to what we were at, but didn't really talk about what type of people these were. Because it actually turns out that when you look at it, um, they're not all peers. They're not all you know, regular individuals. When the government of New York checked into it, they found out that 37% of all the revenue on Airbnb is made by professional property owners and managers. And when Uber checked into it, they found that 18% of their drivers were actually professionals. So this is not just about necessarily amateurs or peers, and it's not just about access. So we were interested in understanding markets that, uh, in a way that conceptualizes them, not just as sharing or collaborating or providing access, but something that's a broad uh, marketplace-oriented uh, phenomenon, something that uses technology platforms to link actors that includes the possibility, perhaps, for the exchange of ownership and not just access, and includes both amateur or peers and professional actors. And so we came up with this term, which you know, we are hoping is more precise than the ones that have been used before. Uh, and, and the term is lateral exchange markets. So we focused on these exchanges as markets, where markets really can be thought of as social arenas where firms, suppliers, customers, workers, and government interact. Uh, these are places that influence the creation, distribution, and consumption of goods and services by human, material, and technological actors. So they're a special kind of market, a lateral exchange market. And we define that as a market that's formed through an intermediating technology platform that facilitates exchange activities among a network of equivalently positioned economic actors. That notion of the equivalently position economic actors is these lateral exchanges. So our conception emphasizes that there's an important role both for the platform and for these what we're calling network actors now, because we see this more as a network. It spotlights commercial exchange, so we're not really interested in things like gift giving. It includes buying, selling, renting, trading, bartering, and swapping as well. So lateral exchange markets are this new form that spawn from the potential of contemporary digital technology to coordinate and monetize networks. They're not a phenomenon that sort of includes a large variety of historical sharing type arrangements. They are explicitly created by technology. That's how we see them. So in a few moments, Rebecca is going to tell you more about how we distinguish between the different kinds of lateral exchange markets that are out there that we found in the world. But the key to understanding them was that we found the, the addition of largely unsupervised social experiences with strangers, think about what happens every time you step into an Uber, to be something that adds a little bit of a, a chaotic element to market experiences. And we wanted to emphasize that managing this seemed to be key to the way these businesses were set up as businesses. That the focus here wasn't on sharing and collaboration, the focus was on trust management. Uh, trust happens anytime that we take on a vulnerable position based on our expectations. It's whenever we place our reliance in the integrity or truthfulness of someone or something. So we could say that the technology, the platform part of lateral exchange markets is created and improved to assist with the creation of a trust economy, a marketplace that people consider trustworthy and worth putting their faith into. Lateral exchange market companies then are sort of a hybrid organization that's evolved government mechanisms that can coordinate trust in exchanges. The social platform used in lateral exchange markets uses technology to manage trust and the downsides of sociality. So it's worth keeping in mind as we go through the presentation 
that there are basically two big kinds of interactions between technology platforms and social experiences that we ended up focusing on. First one is a technology platform can restrain social contact that we have with other people. Uh, people will place their trust in the platform itself, say, rather than the people on it who they don't know. They're strangers to them. Or else the technology platform can try and enhance that social contact, facilitating trust in it by providing ratings and guarantees so that, for example, I would feel okay inviting a stranger who just shows up at my door because I pressed the button on a website, let that stranger into my home to start fixing things or to, or to clean up. So the next slide really just talks about the research questions that we investigated. And we had four interrelated questions we looked at. The first one is about commonality and diversity. Um, how best can we understand these new markets, what they have in common, and what differentiates them? And that's obviously a, a big contribution here is the various forms that they have. The second one is about understanding their underlying characteristics. So what makes them tick? What are some of the most important elements that they share and what differentiates them? The third one gets into some important areas of managerial practice. So given what we found looking at many actual cases of these markets and comparing the results, how do the different types compare to one another in effectiveness? And finally, the last one is what are the implications of all this? How do these aspects affect our theorizing and our management? Uh, so how did we do the study? The methods we used were ethnography and netnography, which included in them a number of other methods, such as archival work and interviews, for example. Uh, the, site, the starting point was Rebecca, really. Re this was Rebecca's dissertation work. And Rebecca started with uh, an initial directory of 247 websites of these kinds of businesses. She coded them and looked at them uh, and thought, you know, uh, what do they have in common, came up with a number of different initial uh, definitions, which we worked together later to refine, but found 193 websites that matched the early definition of lateral exchange markets, collected information on those. The sites shifted a bit as some went out of business, others came into being. But from those original 193 websites, came up with the categories and the underlying characteristics, and then we chose 20 cases as a more detailed purposive sample that we used to conduct comparative case study analysis with more details. So again, a lot of this work came from Rebecca's PhD thesis, and I'm going to turn it over to her to discuss the findings of the research, and then I'm going to be back at the end to summarize, uh, discuss the implications of the findings, and to open things up for your discussions and questions. Go ahead, Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. So as you mentioned, um, I spent six years of my life um, kind of uh, getting to know all these platforms. So as a participant, uh, I found myself buying things. I found myself in the parking lot of places, exchanging with individuals, inviting them into my home uh, to do repairs. Um, during the process of these six years, um, I actually uh, had a baby. And one of the things that I decided to do was that I was going to acquire everything that I needed for my daughter through these platforms. And uh, what that led to is me being exposed to a host of different businesses like we're seeing in this slide now. Um, and as uh, I was trying to understand, uh, you know, what are some of the differences and commonalities between these organizations, um, I, you know, I, I, I found myself sort of mapping them along two axes, right? So all these uh, lateral exchange market platforms intermediate exchanges using a software-based technology platform. However, there are differences on the extent in which that technology is um, you know, really being used to mediate the exchange process itself. Right? So you can think of lining up these uh, organizations along an axis at the bottom that we're calling platform intermediation. And those that are aligned on the left side of your screen, uh, things like Craigslist or FreeCycle, right, have um, you know very you know they get, they don't get very involved on the transactions itself. They've created a platform that invites people to come in, and actors when they're in that platform are responsible for connecting with each other, um, negotiating, uh, arranging their transaction, finalizing that, um, and all of these places have just provided a space for them to do so. On the right hand of our screen, uh, we have platforms more like Uber or uh, ThreadUp that 
you know, you really, really use their technology to mediate that exchange that's happening with individuals. The other axis that um, is we're going to use to organize uh, this business uh, organizations is um, on the left side is the extent of consociality. And what we're talking about here um, is what Rob mentioned earlier about to what extent these companies are constraining or you know, sort of enhancing social relationships with, with individuals, right? And so on the top side of the screen, uh, you have situations, again, like Craigslist, where you know, you're going to meet somebody at their house or at the parking lot um, outside of a store uh, to create the exchange. And on the bottom side of your screen, uh, you have companies like eBay where you're just going to go and click on a button and say, you know, buy it now, and it will get shipped right to your door. Now, in, you know, when we think about this, they're kind of distributed along these axes, right? So they're not you know, like all – there's no interaction at all, or there's a lot of interaction. Um, you know, in eBay, you could contact individuals and start a conversation um, however, the platform is going to create it so that you don't have to do that. Um, and so the social interactions are kind of kept to the minimum. And so if we um, kind of divide this space, right, what we come up is with four, uh, you know, four different types of structural patterns that we observe in the marketplace. Um, where uh, you know, these organizations are distinguished uh, by you know, the, the level of intermediation as well as um, how much they're constricting or facilitating sociality among the network actors. And so, um, so what this leads us to is kind of you know, trying to find some patterns that were in common within these different organizations. So I'm going to walk you through the structure and process that each of these lateral exchange market types uses to offer these benefits to network actors. So the first one that we have on the uh, upper left part of our typology uh, we called forums. Right? And forums connect actors. Uh, an example of this was Craigslist as I described. They've created a platform where people just find each other and connect. These configurations facilitate the flow of services directly between actors, providing low intermediation and high consociality. Uh, the software platform performs one basic task, uh, which is enabling interested individuals to contact and meet new people who have matching needs. Right? So this could be uh, like Harput World would do that with uh, transportation needs. And everything else is sort of left for the actors to do. So these forums really are kind of focused on lowering the search cost of actors uh, that, that, that would incur trying to find each other in a very broad and disorganized market. The second type is enablers. And their value contribution to um, their marketplace is to equip actors for service provision. So they're configured to help individual actors provide services to other actors, right? And so as you can see on the graph in this one, you know, we've got arrows where the platform is really empowering a group of actors that act as sellers, and then those sellers uh, interact with a group of actors that are really mostly there to buy, right? And uh, a great example of this is eBay. Um, and another one we talked about in the paper is Pushmark. So if you're not familiar with this company, uh, they, um, they is an app that you can use to uh, sell new and used fashion goods. And uh, they don't handle the itself, exchange itself, but they rather equip actors for exchange using smartphone-based software applications. So this app simplifies the act of photographing, describing, and listing the items for sale, um, and produces an address prepaid shipping label that actors can print and place on their packages so that they can send that off to their customers. The, um, this type of platform has little or no direct interaction or communication uh, you know, that happens with the buyers and sellers. Right? So they're just looking at the pictures, they buy now, and the seller just connects it and send it off. So this platform's lower search costs as well as decision costs, such as resources, expended, evaluating terms, and assessing expected performance. 
The third type uh, we call matchmakers, and here's where you would have sort of the Ubers of the world. Um, and a lot of attention has been placed on the platforms that can align up in this space on the typology. Matchmakers mediate the service flow between providers and beneficiary actors, and they're characterized by high platform intermediation as well as high levels of consociality, right? So here on the graph, you see the platform starts taking up a bigger role um, on our, um, you know, in our conceptualization, and they're really taking the job to match both the, you know, the drivers and the passengers, right? Um, or you know, another company that I looked at um, is called Doug Vacke, and that matches pet owners with animal caregivers, right? And so. Um, their platform employs quality control processes that include things like interview, training, and reference checks on potential caregivers. It handles the payment, provides pet insurance, money back guarantee, 24 uh, 7 customer support. Um, so, pet owners and caregivers are really encouraged to learn about and communicate with one another, and the company requires active caregivers to provide daily photo updates featuring the pet. So, um, so you can see here, you know, we have a lot of interaction between the actors, and the platform is really involved in the process of mediating exchange. The fourth uh, structure that we see in the market we call hubs, and uh, their value really comes from centralizing and standardizing the service flow. Right? So this looks most like a traditional marketplace. Uh, hubs act as the central point in the exchange, and it really results in two discrete and bidirectional flows of, of, of exchange between the platform provider and the actors, right? So an example here is Lending Club, and that's a place that you can go to invest on loans for other people. However, um, you're not really meeting who is on the other side of the exchange, right? So prospective borrowers apply for loans online, and the Lending Club's technology uses algorithms along with other uh, available credit data to assess their risk level and assign them a uh, corresponding interest rate. On the other side of the exchange, then an investor can come in uh, to invest on these prospective lenders, and they can build a diversified loan portfolio that earns monthly returns based on differential levels of borrowed risk. So HOBs are often in it's hard to even distinguish from just a traditional enterprise, right? I would say the big difference with hubs is that the input is another actor in this network, right? So rather than having you know, suppliers uh, that you know, would be um, you know, more established and you know, would be a business organization that sort, they're really leveraging a network of actors that are in equitable positions. Um, so now that I have explained sort of the four um, lateral exchange configurations and the different value propositions they offer, let me share some of the cases that, um, that we examined. So the first one is forms, right? And as I mentioned, forms um, are really focused on connecting actors. Um, and uh, an example that I have here uh, would be you know, Craigslist. Uh, I found myself you know, meeting a lot of strangers in parking lots to exchange things. <laughs> Um, and, and, and buy a lot of baby toys and clothing for my children. And, uh, and so it's, you know, the experience here was very social. So I would say, well, hubs, when I was talking before in the last section, was um, you know, almost identical to established business. Forums is what we typically would see as like the you know, ultimate peer-to-peer -peer sort of exchange. Um, this, uh, this type is uh, really distinguished from other types by having the most social user experience. And people come to these platforms to have that social, that social experience. It's risky. They understand that the platform is not involved in the mediation of the exchange, but that's part of the attractiveness. So I interviewed a lot of individuals that were using Craigslist uh, to you know, buy and sell uh, goods. And, you know, they really mentioned that part of the reason they wanted to use it um, was that they wanted to negotiate. They wanted that opportunity uh, to really interact with the other actor and uh, negotiate and, you know, and, and really get the best deal that they could. Um, it relies on high levels of sociality to mitigate trust concerns. So Rob had spoke earlier sort of about the mechanisms that, um, that really keep these different 
forums going. And in a forum is really based on sociality. Sociality is what um, you know, actors have to trust each other in order to continue their exchange. Um, it creates some issues, though. Um, of course, with Craigslist, we've, you know, we've heard you know, some of the uncertainties uh, that can happen with Craigslist. They, you know, there's risk concerns. And so you know, they do warn on their platforms to their users that this is, uh, this is a possibility. Um, yet we still see that um, the, you know, the, the delegation of exchange responsibility really falls onto individuals. In enablers, um, here we're talking about you know, low interaction among actors, uh, low platform intermediation. Um, I've spoken of eBay as an example, uh, but I also want to share with you my experiences with Kickstarter. So Kickstarter is a crowdfunding platform for creative projects such as films, artworks, book music, video games, and gadgets. Um, and this is a decentralized system that has very minimal involvement in coordination of the transaction. So they've created a platform where these act, this, um, artists can showcase uh, what they have to offer, um, but it's really up to the, actor, to the actors in that network to deliver on that promise. Um, in fact, Kickstarter still um, uh, comments on their website uh, that it is ultimately um, the responsibility of um, of those that are offering their, uh, their innovations to make sure that they're coming through on their financial goals and deadlines, et cetera. So what we see here different from uh, Craigslist, though, is that there's minimal interaction happening. So I observed this uh, interaction um, with an uh, uh, individual uh, called Lucky Girl, and she was a popular indie pop folk artist um, that had, or had already enjoyed some success and uh, she kind of used this platform to tell her story. So she was um, you know, a struggling mother and had survived cancer and kind of took, you know, took a video to really you know, tell her story. And uh, you know, she said that she was ready to reclaim something, uh, some sense of herself as her own person. And uh, even though there was very little communication going back and forth, um, she was able to exceed her funding goals um, in a near record time, um, raise over $53,000, right? So what we see here um, is minimal interaction, but people are able to just fund that um, and use sort of the technology platform to do so. So matchmakers, these are the ones that pair actors, right? So these are high consociality, um, high platform intermediation. Again, sort of the Ubers of the world, right? They combine technology and sociology in, socia <laughs> sociality in a very sophisticated way. So this platform used their systems to decrease search costs, simplify decisions, locate matches that are superior to um, the, the, what the actors could achieve on their own. Um, this type of platform, um, they are tasked with managing unpredictabilities of sociology, and they monitor um, the safety of the exchange. So uh, you'll find these platforms offering not only ratings, but also um, guarantees. So uh, for example, TaskRabbit um, is a platform that connects vetted skilled freelance labor with actors in their neighborhood that are seeking services such as cleaning, shopping, delivery, moving assistant, or home repair, right? And uh, I actually went, you know, I moved across the country from Florida to California, and so I employ the use of task rabbits to do so. And uh, it was really, it, it, you know, an interesting experience. Task rabbit really facilitates sort of the search. You know, they come, their taskers are background check. Um, they process the payment. Uh, so it really feels when they show up at your door, um, you know, they really feels like it's a friend that's coming to help you, right? And the platform is uh, providing customer support, provides liability insurance, guarantees satisfaction. Uh, so it's really um, offering institutional arrangements that really legitimate the business. Um, and so uh, this is sort of what characterizes this space. Um, they, uh, they're sort of a hybrid commercial, communal, and social technological structure uh, that really re reaches its most sophisticated realization here.
Lastly, we have hubs, uh, which you know, really are focused on standardizing the service flow. These are the ones that are very hard to distinguish from traditional business. And um, they, are, um, they integrate resources from the different actors in their network and really serve as a central place to enact exchanges. Uh, These uh, platforms provide network actors with many assurances against risk. So they create the marketplace, they lower the search costs, they offer product guarantees, they monitor the actors in it and ensure that the exchange transpires as planned. Right? And um, an interesting example um, on this space is a company like ThreadUp so that also illustrates a bit of the shifts and changes that we see in this space. So um, even though we conceptualize this typology, you know, makes, makes it seem fairly simple, what we see in real life is that these companies evolve and change. And ThreadUp is a great example of that. So, ThreadUp is a marketplace for exchanging uh, gently used clothing for children, uh, now also women as well. But it was founded originally to resemble more of an enabler platform. So they were like an online swapping platform for men's shirt, you know, and they kind of it was kind of like the eBay's of men's shirt sort of space. Um, but it turned out to be a very limited marketplace for them. And eventually, they sort of evolved into what they called a concierge model in which they were facilitating some of the exchange between individuals moving to a higher level of platform intermediation. With this new model for ThreadUp, they really resemble the organization of a hub in which they are um, um, really facilitating the exchange in individuals uh, by mediating this process. So for example, if you want to sell your items on ThreadUp, you would you know, put your gently used clothing into a prepaid, ready to ship recycling bag and you send that off to them. And their staff will then sort through the items, take pictures, uh, uh, verify the condition of those items, um, and they will you know, reward the seller back based on sort of the quality and quantity of the clothes that they offer. On the other side of that, uh, for buyers, you can go into this t uh, platform and you can sort and look through this, all of this clothing as if it was just all offered from ThreadUp. Right? So they get the clothes from other individuals, but when you go to their site, you don't really know what came from who. Um, they have curated all this content, and you can order as if you were doing any online retailer. You can order the size, the color, sort, do all of that. And they really have um, created an experience for the buyer. Once you order, they'll wrap your clothing in tissue paper, attach it with tags that read, renew with love, and they will ship it off to you in a signature polka dot box uh, that's sealed with a sticker that says, enjoy. Um, and again, you know, they really kind of resembling, uh, you know, the more traditional shopping experience rather than peer to peer. And so, um, we one of the things we observe with hubs is that they do not need to provide public profiles or peer reviews to stimulate trust between actors, uh, because people interact with the platform itself rather than with the individual. So when I buy clothes for my children from ThreadUp, um, I don't interact with the mom behind that. I'm just really trusting ThreadUp that their, their, their quality that they've assessed um, is good. And um, they remain in control of the exchange. They provide privacy while insurance quality, satisfaction, and a very consistent user experience. So you learn to trust the platform uh, rather than have to trust each other of the peers. And just like we saw the evolution of ThreadUp, we also saw evolutions in all kinds of directions in the marketplace. And so in our paper, which we're, you know, we link at the end of the presentation, we really discussed that if this shifts, um, you know, some more successful than others. Um, but I think an interesting observation here is that there isn't a particular type that was most successful. Um, in fact, you know, sometimes you would have uh, or businesses shifting to lower intermediation, while sometimes they were shifting to higher, um, and the same with consociality. Um, and so I think that's um, a lot of uh, interesting developments uh, that we're seeing in the space. 
So I hope this example illustrates sort of the diversity of lateral exchange markets and demonstrate how these underlying dimensions of sociality and platform intermediation work in concert with institutional attempts to legitimate the company to provide either effective or ineffective solutions to governance and trust issues. So I will now hand it off to Rob to sort of discuss the implication of these findings for marketing theory and managerial practice. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. I just want to note, because uh, I thought it was interesting before I get into a summary, uh, that these four forms are actually closely related to four ancient forms of marketplace uh, that anthropologists have studied. So forums are related to the agoras of old, the, uh, the ancient marketplaces where all sorts of good services and even ideas were encountered and traded. Matchmakers are, of course, related to the agents who set up all kinds of business and other one-on-one -on -one relationships as a form of, of trade or exchange. Uh, enablers are a lot like ancient bazaars, which brought customers together to one central place and equipped a variety of sellers to meet their needs. And, and hubs are like consignment stores and consignment type arrangements. So we thought that relationship to ancient forms of markets was very interesting. So even though the technologies are new, the forms and the human needs for reassurance and trust beneath them are, are quite ancient. So, so to moving on to, a, to an overview and a summary of some of the bigger findings from our research before we uh, go on to discuss its implications now. Um, lateral exchange market platforms create, maintain, and help to discipline markets in complex ways. Acting as an intermediary in the exchanges, the LEM platform provides two potential benefits. It creates the marketplace and it lowers various transaction costs. Acting as a social space, some platforms offer the opportunity to communicate, personalize, and negotiate between lateral market actors. So you heard Rebecca's examples of, of Craigslist and people wanting to be able to reach people so that they can negotiate price. But others, and you heard her talk about ThreadUp, constrain it, and they direct it through the platform itself, like thread up taking people's clothes, sorting it, uh, assessing its condition, uh, posting that on their website, and selling directly. So in general, when the need for trust or interpersonal contact is high, it's met with one of two things, either a high level of platform intermediation, as with thread up, higher levels of sociality, and in additional institutional arrangements to help people to judge the legitimacy of the actors with things like reputation systems and ratings. So TaskRabbit, for example, would be a great example of something that uses a whole bunch of assurances, guaranteed and ratings of people before you let the stranger into your house to fix something uh, or to put up your IKEA bookshelves or to move you across the country as Rebecca did. Uh, in many cases, including Craigslist and Skillshare, we can see how sociality and co-presence introduce this degree of unpredictability that can have positive as well as negative uh, outcomes. So for example, Lyft brags about the fact that a number of marriages have started through Lyft rides. Um, on the downside part, there are over 20 murders that have been attributed to Craigslist uh, because that, it, that element of bringing people together in a, in a forum can be quite uh, out of control. Overall, because of the complexity involved in markets and human behavior, a variety of other institutional forces play a part in how lateral exchange markets function and how they need to be managed. And those also include other elements like the legal system, existing industry players, and public opinion. So now let's move on to some implications uh, and how it works. So although the so-called sharing economy has grown rapidly and received a lot of public attention over the past few years, the fact that it's relatively new means we still don't know very much about how it actually operates and how to manage it. So marketing managers working in these disruptive new fields need to make decisions about their businesses without the existing guidelines that managers in established industries benefit from. As well, many existing companies are entering lateral exchange markets as complementary businesses. So the picture on this slide here uh, is of sustainability-minded outdoor company Patagonia which entered the lateral exchange market field with this common threads partnership of theirs, which essentially acts as an enabler to connect and uh, provide a uniform service experience for customers wanting to exchange to buy and sell their secondhand Patagonia clothing. So they're saying, if you want secondhand clothing, 
you can also uh, cover this with a lateral exchange market type arrangement that Patagonia itself oversees. So you could think of similar businesses that co could complement their existing operations uh, in a similar way. So for example, used musical instruments would be one, or art, or furniture, or electronics. Uh, all of these would sort of be similar types of arrangements. But if we want to go you know, further than simply saying general advice to you, like consider bringing lateral exchange market forms uh, to your business, uh, we wanted to actually take that further to pull out implications for our audience. Um, so one of the first, compre you know, as one of the first comprehensive investigations of lateral exchange markets, we wanted to offer more specific guiding principles. So let's spend the next few minutes discussing the strategic implications of our research that could be useful both to establish players extending operations into the new forms, like Patagonia did, as well as to managers of uh, pure play, pure based businesses such as Uber and a number of the ones that we've already been discussing. So you know, the first point we want to make is that awareness of the type of lateral exchange market you are is the first step to being able to effectively manage it. Forums, matchmakers, enablers, and hubs each have particular forms of value creation that should focus managers' investments and their resource deployment. So don't get confused like many of our research colleagues did and think that one size necessarily fits all. It doesn't. A hub shouldn't be managed like a forum. It probably can't be successful if it is. However, it's complicated because some of the lines between these things, these are continua. They're not discrete variables. So some of the lines can be quite, uh, quite flexible and, and quite dynamic. Yet each of these four types of market creates value for its network actors in particular ways, uh, as I think Rebecca has explained very well. It faces particular kinds of transaction risk that also need to be managed in particular ways. So balancing network actors' trust in the transaction with the risk that actors uh, have, and one of those big risks is that once you connect these actors, they won't need the platform anymore. That's a big risk that we saw uh, repeated in a number of these arrangements, particularly matchmaker type arrangements. So let me run through the next four slides and tell you a little bit about some of the specific forms of guidance our research offers to managers operating in each of the four lateral exchange market types, so starting with forums. So forums reduce, search content, co sorry, forums reduce search costs and provide their greatest customer value by facilitating connections. Therefore, forums need to invest in technologies and platforms that attract significant numbers of people to the network and then empower them to communicate with each other. Although it might be tempting, especially given the downside of things like uh, uh, Craigslist, to try to take over control of between actor communication or to filter them somehow through the company, our model suggests that the forms are actually most effective when they facilitate a free flow of messages between people. That's their purpose. Managing the transaction risk that, accom that accompany that risk, though, is a bit tricky. One way that's uh, been used to approach it is to educate network actors about the unregulated nature of the market and to inform, inform them in no uncertain terms to be careful and cautious about their exchanges. You can also add in layers of volunteer moderators. You can layer reputation systems and third-party verification that can be helpful, additions to the system that can verify actors and inspire trust. And you know, we're seeing, obviously, investments and development of these kinds of technologies to be increasingly useful and valuable across a number of areas in the economy, and particularly with these, all of these lateral exchange markets. But managers and forum companies would be wise to realize that Safety concerns are likely to be a fact of life, and adopting appropriate legal and fiscal safeguards, such as disclaimers and liability insurance, is a wise move. Uh, companies that provide such services uh, may be in increasing demand, the ones who do those legal services and fiscal uh, safeguards, uh, and we also think that forward-thinking governments uh, will probably be also be thinking about regulation to help companies to manage these, uh, the trust relationships more effectively. In terms of enablers, enablers provide value by lowering search costs and making it easier for actors to decide to transact. Uh, to be successful in an enabler, managers should focus on equipping actors with tools that are sufficient to allow them to provide outstanding value to other actors. So equipment can be in the form of tools and technologies, providing convenient forms and formats. For, uh, all of these sort of things can be programmed into the software interface of the platform. 
tools are going to simplify and standardize the active value creation for network actors who are selling their wares or their skills. But how do you manage trust in an enabler-based uh, transaction? Uh, that, again, is challenging because the company is responsible for maintaining a minimally social environment. So actors relate to uh, each other almost exclusively through their market offerings or stories related to them. They enact their transactions with really a bare minimum, of, if any, of direct communication with other network actors. Again, that bare minimum needs to be managed, perhaps by allowing only a standardized branding effort for sellers, like, sort of like what you see on, um, on uh, crowdfunding sites like Kickstarter. Something uh, that the person gives, like a little story, like the one that Rebecca shared, that the person uses to inspire interest and to gain trust. So we would expect that technologies that can also that can patent and provide these enabler-like tools are also going to become uh, in higher demand as these forms of enabler grow. And we did find that enablers and hubs were, I think, the, sort of the, the areas that were still the smallest but that were growing the most among these lateral exchange markets. Um, the next one to talk about is matchmakers. And matchmakers exist in order to lower monitoring costs, to simplify searches, and to facilitate better decision-making for actors. Uh, they provide the greatest source of value by appropriately pairing network actors. Uh, the strategies for managers of matchmakers must then embrace and manage the risk that accompany high consociality. So that means having a selection of third-party screening, identity verification, and reputation systems that would be deployed and offered to network actors. And that's to take care of safety concerns and help to reduce the hazards that happen because you are um, uh, in the co-presence of someone. You are physically there. In order to ensure a, a superior service, matchmakers also have to combine their high-platform intermediation with a selection of actor training and certification, standardization, quality verification, and other kinds of customer satisfaction guarantees. And we thought about it a lot, and we decided that rather than avoid it, the matchmaker should probably lean into the inherent consociality in the matchmaker model, just as we talked about it with forums. Um, and, and the tendency to lead to social connection. But it's trickier for matchmakers because they also have that high platform intermediation as well. Uh, many companies like, for example, uh, Uber and Lyft, they assure actors that they won't be paired again with other actors if they've given them a low rating. But we think uh, you could do something similar on, on the other end when you do like someone. If you did like a service provider, let's say you liked your Uber driver, maybe you would be more likely to be paired with them again. Uh, and so it's sort of, uh, would work with this fact that it builds relationships. But that has risks too, of course, the classic risk of the matchmaker, which I mentioned before. Uh, there's a danger that once connected, network actors are going to engage in additional transactions outside the platform and outside the network. Um, matchmakers really should try and do everything they can uh, to ameliorate that problem, combining the enticements of familiar network actors, a cutting-edge platform, high quality standards and important exchange safeguards with sort of moral suasion and communal norms that discourage out of network exchanges. We saw these being brought in by a number of, of uh, these types of companies. So it's never perfect, but managers in these business forms need to combine business, technology, cultural and technology means to get the job done and to keep the revenue flowing from it. And the last one to talk about is hubs. So hubs lower the cost associated with search the, the costs associated with decision making, with monitoring, and with exchange reinforcement. Um, they do this by centralizing the exchanges. The platform company is the one engaging in the direct service interaction with the network actors. Uh, managers have to manage hubs in a way that avoids the social benefits of human contact and trust that really are kind of a key part of forums and matchmakers, which I just talked about. Hubs seem to be growing, but the relative proportion of these forms needs more research. We don't really know it. But we did notice um, that the type of business matters here. So hubs seem to work well with more quantitative, interchangeable, what we would call fungible markets and goods, such as finance or selling standardized goods. Um, trust in the brand of the platform would become very important for hubs, more than in any of the other forms of lateral exchange market. Uh, thus, hubs should probably invest strongly in the branding and the promotion of the platform's brand itself. In addition, the technology of the platform becomes another differentiator. 
So the cutting edge abilities of the platform, things like ease of use, capacity to assess or mitigate risk, or strong technical performance, uh, are other places that management can invest, manage, and differentiate from competition if they're working in the hubs area. So that's, that is the four areas and what we see as some implications from them. The, the last slide really is focusing on ongoing challenges a little bit. So we could say that lateral exchange markets open new doors of opportunity uh, through coordinating people and information together in time and space. But as technologies today do, they've also blurred the distinctions between markets and social activities, between what is private and what is public, between full-time work and part-time work, between the brand of the platform and between people's business relationships with each other. So think about Lyft and Uber, Airbnb and Couchsurfing. These platforms are a mix of ideological and structural, the technological and the social. And that means that their moral economies are still evolving too. Despite disputes about the moral economies of the so-called gig economy are pervasive, with Uber drivers in Los Angeles making, I'm estimating, about 15 bucks an hour before expenses, while corporate head, head office investors and shareholders get rich. Uber has had a number of harassment and leadership scandals. It's been accused of programming and rounding errors that cheated drivers of millions of dollars. Those are just some of the most important and difficult issues that marketing practitioners working in a post-trust age currently face. Because when we talk about managing lateral exchange markets, these platforms of sociality in a digital economy, we're not just talking about market decisions, but also market disruption, social change, public issues, and regulative and instructional issues. Hidden within lateral exchange markets surface level of convenience, equity, and peers the whole window dressing of sharing, is often a rather ruthless technocracy that has a number of problems with inclusion and fairness. In case after case after case, we see the potential efficiencies coexisting with a dramatic possibility for exploitation as well. Lateral exchange markets are changing business and society. We hope that we've made a small contribution to understanding them in this, the dawn of their age. And with that, Thank you very much, and I think we have a few minutes to take some questions. Thanks very much, Rob and Rebecca. That was great. Um, yeah, let me pull up a couple of questions that came in. You, you talked, especially toward the end, about brand. But one, one uh, maybe that's something you could elaborate a little bit more on. In other words, um, is this the kind of product or platform, I guess, company that one would want to invest in building and developing the brand and doing all the, the things that you do to try to have your own branded platform? Is that, is that the key message here? Rebecca, you want to take it or you want me to? Uh, sure, go ahead and take it. I, I, I have another one that I'm looking here that I'm going to answer for Marie. Oh, you're, you're, you're reading ahead. Okay. I mean, I think it's really important to answer your question, Gordon. You know, um, if we look at the, the the hub model, uh, um, you know, where where the platform itself becomes the brand. So, for yeah. example, thread up selling clothing, it's that's where you want to really trust the brand, right? Um, Craigslist, I don't think brand is really important to Craigslist. They don't need to. They're a forum, so they're just providing this this setting for people to get together and interact. So it's kind of you know, it's it's I'm a retail guy too, so. It's kind of like, you know, is the brand of the shopping mall important or is the, the brand of the store that you're in important? Um, most of the time it's not the shopping mall itself that's important. It's you're going to the store that's, that's in there. And that's who you're going to have the trusting relationship with. Um, so, you know, matchmakers where you've got this high level of, of, of uh, platform intermediation again and hubs where you've got high platform intermediation again, that's where you're investing in the brand a lot. Not so much uh, in the forums and, and the enablers as much. You know, Etsy, yes, sure you trust Etsy, but it's, it's the individual craftspeople on Etsy, I think, that, that you are attracted to and, and who also uh, have to build their brands. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Rebecca, did you say you wanted to respond to something? Yeah, so I see a question here. I mean, it was something actually that we struggled with even as we were writing the paper. So uh, someone asked, could you explain why eBay is not on the same level of platform intermediation as Airbnb? 
since mm-hmm. the money on eBay is sent through, um, you know, PayPal, you know, an integrated PayPal app to each eBay account. And I think the reason I wanted to answer that question, uh, because I think it's important that we consider that real-life manifestations of this um, the lateral exchange markets are going to vary, right, along this continuum, right? And that was why we made that access be, con- you know, continuous in intermediation from low to high. And um, eBay was kind of on the borderline, I would say, you know, offering yeah. the highest intermediation that we saw for an enabler. Um, but the reason why we ended up classifying it as an enabler was because when we looked deeper into um, – other aspects of the exchange. So, for example, offering uh, guarantees or vetting and, you know, these additional, you know, background checks, things like that. eBay's guarantees were pretty lax. And so once we started digging into it, eBay wouldn't even uh, be part of the remediation process unless you've already tried to resolve the problem with the seller. Um, And even then, the guarantee was simply about whether an item was, in fact, um, showcased, you know, it it was accurately represented on the post, uh, not whether your, you you know, your satisfaction with that device was, or, or, uh, or aspect was, um, if you were satisfied with what you had received. And so, uh, so really, you know, kind of what put it into the enabler category is that it really seemed like eBay was allowing uh, the sellers on their platforms to be in charge of that service recovery when things went wrong. Um, but I think, you know, as you know, one of my slides mentioned there was that, you know, we see this shift in the marketplace. So whether down the road we may see eBay kind of evolve to a higher uh, intermediation, that's possible. Another distinction um, with uh, Airbnb is the higher level of consociality among the actors. So while eBay may be getting closer to Airbnb and intermediation, they're still very different in terms of, you know, the co-presence that actors have when they're participating in the exchange. Well, I mean, it's fair to say, based on what you had said, both, that this is a a new field in a sense, although some great links back to uh, some of the history of the same models. But it is a lot of these companies, or most of them, are very new, and I'm wondering if you can just, sort of give us any kind of thoughts for the future in terms of, you know, where do you think this is going? It it seems like it's a major factor in the development of markets going forward, but appreciate your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to see a lot more of this kind of stuff as, um, you know, technology and web applications are are only becoming a a bigger part of people's lives. And, uh, these kind of coordination mechanisms are, are really um, becoming very important. Uh, as well, the, the, the companies are, are gathering a lot of money and, and becoming more influential. So I think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Rebecca, but if Uber starts bringing in self-driving cars, it's no longer a lateral exchange market, right? It just right. It, 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 it pops off of our model. So, you know, uh, I think one of the things people should take from this is that it's highly dynamic. And to answer your question directly, Gordon, I, it's, it's not even about, you know, the markets are fascinating and I think very important, but the larger phenomena of technology um, entering marketplaces and changing our social lives as well as, as, as the way that we do business and transact and, and use goods, I think is really important. And that's something I don't want to lose from all the enthusiasm around the, the, the sharing, you know, the sharing economy literature. I think the term sharing is, is very misleading. It has not, you know, in the long run been particularly helpful to us. But I think that um, it's, it's pointing to something that has a social, a social implication to it. And we really, we really didn't want to lose that. Um, so my thoughts on the future are that I think uh, we're going to see more of this in general. And I also think, and I, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about it, Rebecca, but I think we're going to see more action in the enablers and hubs areas where they're reducing sociality now. I think, you know, the social part of the experience is the unpredictable part. And I think what's happening uh, is they're layering more technology onto these transactions and, and centralizing it more. ThreadUp is a great example because it started out as a very social thing. When you give your example, Rebecca, about eBay, that also was interesting because when I started on eBay, which was back in the, in the 90s, um, 
eBay was a social place too. And you, you used to have notes to people and you'd have an email exchange afterwards with them. And you got to know people kind of as individuals. But, but that's not the eBay of today anymore. There's just so many big professional sellers on eBay. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's more like, um, you know, a, a different kind of Amazon experience almost. So that's, well, that's my feeling. Great. Well, thanks very much uh, for those <clears throat> comments about the future. Uh, certainly there's a lot to look for in the future and to investigate and to watch for. So uh, this is very, very, very helpful. Thanks. And uh, if we didn't get to your specific questions or there are additional things you'd like to discuss or comment on, uh, we do invite you to reach out to Rob and Rebecca and their uh, email addresses are on that slide. So feel free to get in touch. Thanks again uh, to Rob and Rebecca. And just as a reminder, our next webinar will be Liars detecting fictitious product reviews via a combination of automatic text analysis and experiments. And that's with Ann Cronrod on December 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Many thanks to the members of the MSI audience for participating in our Member to Member webinar series.